God's work through us as people, as Christians in a pagan culture, it threatens the lifestyle of those living contrary to God. Nehemiah is about the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem that are all have been torn down. They've been destroyed, right? And these walls, they point to the steps to recovery in a damaged and ruined areas of our life, okay? So, so we each have stuff in our life that has been damaged by sin, that's been damaged by things that have happened to us in the past, things that we have done, choices we've made, and that's damaged, and it's caused there to be kind of ruins that are, that are here around us. We are the temple of God, the temple of uh, the temple of God in that place is where God inhabits. Now the temple is us. God lives within those who are believers. And so that temple, there's ruins around it though. And the struggle that Nehemiah has when he hears about this is that God is being disgraced by it. Okay, that's the problem. God is being disgraced. God's reputation looks bad because of the ruins that are, are around the temple because of God's people. It makes God look bad. It disgraces God. And so what we find is Nehemiah, Nehemiah, he, he weeps and it deeply affects him that God is being disgraced by what has happened from the people of Israel that's caused this destruction, okay? That bothers him a lot. And so he begins to pray. And uh, after about four months, he gets this opportunity. You know, he's the cupbearer. So he's drinking, he's drinking the wine before, the, before uh, the king does, right? And so he'll drink it and say, oh, there's no poison in this, right? And then he'll hand it over and you know, eat the salad and say, oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, you can eat this, right? So he, he does that. Well, he gets an opportunity then to, uh, to go uh, to Jerusalem to start building. And so one of the things we found is that Nehemiah takes the opportunity that he has to, to work on things. When God gives him an opportunity to fix the ruins in our life, he jumps on it. Right? And, so, and so when we have issues in our life, when we have struggles, when we have broken walls of our lives, when we have, have this sin or that sin, or, or there's turmoil, there's issues, when we have those, those broken walls in our lives, when God gives us opportunity to make it right, you got to jump on it. Right? You got to jump on it. So he jumps on it, and now he's going forward. And so last week, we saw that he organized and shared this huge task of rebuilding with a whole bunch of people that were there. It read kind of like the phone book. You remember? We had the, the sermon about the phone book last week where it was name after name after name. And if you just listen to that, that sermon, if you just read chapter 3, you'd think that this whole thing of rebuilding all the walls went off without a hitch. Right? Because it said so-and-so built this wall. It was by his house. And then the priests, they built uh, this and... and uh, this guy, he built the, this certain wall, and, and, and then this gate was built by, and, and it just shows us, just real, real regular, right? Go through, and oh, well, that went off without a hitch. That was nice. Uh-uh. Didn't go off without a hitch at all. That's just the chapter that tells you who was involved. Now it gets into the nitty-gritty, and it shows you all the nightmare that it takes to go through this struggle, because, because doing what God wants you to do is not an easy thing. And the main point we're going to get here today is this. I'll put it on the screen and it's in your notes. When you set out to do God's work, you can expect opposition from the enemy. Okay? When you set out to do what God wants you to do, and I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's corporate. I don't care if it's as a church. We've decided that we're going to reach people with the gospel and we're going to, we're going to disciple people and we're going to love people and we're going to serve. And we're, I don't care what it is. If, if it's the Lord's work, you're going to face opposition. If it's individual and it's involved in your own life and you're struggling with something, you're like, God, God has shown me this area of my life and I'm weak here and this is the problem. And God, God is disgraced by this in my life. People look at me and they, they know I'm a Christian and they see this in my life and they go, well, your God must not be so big. Your God must not be so tough. Your God must be... When you decide to change that and you decide to make a change in your life, the enemy will pick up. And so the big question we're going to face this morning is this. Um, what kind of opposition can we expect? Right? I mean, if you're going to have opposition come to you because you start to do the work of God, it'd be nice if you had some kind of an idea what to expect. Right? And so we're going to go through this because that's what happens in Nehemiah 4. They decide, they start rebuilding the walls and all hell breaks loose. First time I ever planted a church, I was 33 years old. 
I was in Seattle. And boy, as soon as we started to do things, the enemy hit. It was the worst. My ba- I ended up having a back surgery. When I only had like nine people on the team. And of those nine, I had to have surgery. I had a guy, uh, they called it a widow maker. He had a heart attack that was like, he, ne- he, he was almost de- dead. I mean, it was, it was bad. It was one thing after another. Uh, the women were having all kinds of emotional issues and problems. The men were having all kinds of physical problems. And you got, we got to the point where we're like, dude, what in the world are we doing? Why? We would have been a lot safer. That was the thought went through our head. We would have been a lot safer if we've decided to just, all right, you do your thing, devil, and we'll do our thing here. And it just doesn't work that way. And so what can you expect? Let's open up in our Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 4. And as you open up to it, I'm going to pray for us that God allows us to really grasp this and understand what he's trying to teach us this morning. God, you got a lot in the word you want to tell us. Um, God, we're, we're a people that want to stand up for Jesus. We want to stand up for God. We want to stand up for what you say. We want to tell the truth in love. We want to be uh, your hands and feet in the world. And we know that when we do that, the enemy is out against us and he wants to stop us. And he's going to use some tactics that we're going to learn here in a minute, God. And I pray, God, that you'd help us to see these tactics clearly. God, that we would not be deceived by the world around us that tries to tell us that we're not being deceived, that this is the way it is. God, that you'd you'd reveal this to us, God, and empower us and, and equip us through your Holy Spirit to handle this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here's what it says. Uh, It starts out now when you've seen this guy before this guy we saw him like a couple chapters past and they they didn't like That that nehemiah's come here and is rebuilding all this. I'll explain that in a minute says now sambala um, Sambalat sambala sambala. I'm not quite sure exactly how you pronounce it, but uh, Sambalat heard that we were building the wall. He was angry and greatly enraged and he jeered at the jews so the first thing we'll say is that we can expect anger against us right and you say well why is sanbalat why is sanbalat uh or sanbalat why is he so angry with the jews well first of all here's what you need to know about him he is the governor of samaria okay so right the samaritans and the jews they're not real friendly right they're not real friendly with each other we see that a lot of times in the Bi- in the bible in the new testament with jesus there's issues between the samaritans and the jews but it kind of starts back here and the problem is that the samaritans have a lot of control right now because israel and jerusalem are in rubble right and there's no walls there and they have no defenses and so they're not in control of anything and so really samaria can do whatever it wants to samaria can act however it wants to their lifestyle is a certain lifestyle that they can do because there's no israel there right they 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 can trade however they want to they can get things that they want that, 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 that they won't be able to get if israel is there as israel is there and walled up it's gonna change them right it's gonna affect them right so god god's work through us as people as christians in a pagan culture okay it threatens the lifestyle of those living contrary to god i'm speaking this in the greatest month that you could say this sentence The word of God and the people of God threaten a lifestyle that is contrary to God. Okay? I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but I will. Okay? Why are people so angry at us right now? Why this month is the world so angry at Christians? Because they have lied to the world and put out a narrative about pride that is a lie okay what what's being taught to our children and what's being taught in school and what's being taught by our 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 own president is this that pride and and the rainbow flag is about love and acceptance of everyone as you are that that's what that is that's what pride is 
Now let me say something else about that. The rainbow, okay, boy, this, this work is, you know where the rainbow comes from? You know what the rainbow's about, right? Deep, horrible sin that God decided it was so bad that the world was so sinful that he decided to destroy the entire world, everybody, except for eight people who were going to be faithful to him. He destroys them all. He wipes them all out. Kills them all. And says, I'm going to start over. And then he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put, I'm going to put a symbol in the sky. It's a rainbow. And that rainbow, what that represents is this. That never again am I going to destroy you all via flood for your sin. I'm going to be merciful to you. I'm going to be merciful to you. I'm, go I'm, going, to say, I'm, go I'm going to say, you know what? My mercy has shown through over my judgment, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to be merciful. I'm never going to do this again to you. And so what is the response of mankind today in America? Let's take that very symbol that God said, says that you're not going to destroy me, and let's just throw it up in his face and say, not only we're going to claim this for ourselves, and we're proud of the sin that you destroyed us for before. We're proud of it. We're ex and actually, what we're going to do, it's not just about, see, homosexuality, that word's never used in the scripture. You know what word is used in scripture? Sodomy. The word's called sodomy. So in Deuteronomy 20, 22, there's two things. This isn't in my notes. I'm just kind of... In Deuteronomy 22, there are two things that it talks about, okay? The first one is cross-dressing. It says that it's an abomination for a man to act or to dress like a woman. That, that there are two sexes. There's men and women, and men are supposed to be men. Women are supposed to be women, and that you start getting all messed up when you have men that start to dress like women or you have women starting to dress like men, that that's an abomination according to God. But then he goes further and he says, the other thing that you have, I have a problem with is when men start having sexual relationships with other men and women with other women. And he calls that sodomy and he destroys a town called Sodom because of that very sin, okay? And what America has done and what our schools have done and what they're trying to teach is this. We want to normalize sodomy. We want to normalize sodomy. We want sodomy. Do you know what sodomy is? If you don't, don't Google it because you'll get a video of it. Sodomy is, is bad. It's men on men. Women on, it, it's, it's not good completely unnatural, completely not what God wants. And what our president wants to do is to make that, he wants to make that normal. That it's okay. That's fine, right? And, and if you say that that's wrong, you hate people and we're gonna do away with you. We're, we're gonna put you aside. When you see this group on TV and they're protesting, they are angry, I never saw people so angry. These people are angry, and they hate you, and they hate God. They hate a God who, what, what, did, what happened here? What happened here? It says God's, God works through us when God's, uh, God's work through us threatens the lifestyle of those living contrary to God. And so we're going to take this flag, this rainbow flag, that you put out as a, as, a merciful, as a merciful thing, saying, I'm not going to destroy you, right? I'm not going to destroy you again by flood. I'll do it by fire, right? I'm going to do it by fire. It's not like judgment's not coming again. But you know what the dumbest thing you can possibly do is? Take a flag that's the color of the rainbow and, and stick that in God's face and say, na, 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 na. That's what's happening. And if the church is standing up, what we're standing up for is, listen, we're not going to allow you to normalize sodomy. We're not going to allow you to normalize that type of behavior. We're not going to allow you to go into our schools and teach our kids how to cross-dress. Okay. 
so they're mad. And Satan often uses anger of others to squelch the passion of new believers. So you become a new believer, and you believe in and you trust in Jesus. And what's the first thing that happens is people come up to you that don't agree with you, and they're angry, and they're in your face, and they're like, blah, 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 and they're like this, and you're like, oh, dude, I don't want to be involved with that because I don't like people being angry with me. And I, you get back, and you're like, well, dude, I, I don't like that. And, it, and it's scary, right, because you don't know. And there's some legitimacy to that t- these days. J- just to set your mind at ease, if you hear some pop, pop, pop during the service, it's not an active shooter. They're going to be popping balloons downstairs. <laughs> My wife told me that. So just, just want to, thought I'd throw that out for you. If it doesn't sound like balloons, I want you to just be careful. All right. Just, just, just telling you. Let's go on because I got off track. So that, that was for free. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones on the heap of the rubbish and burn one one, uh, and burn ones of that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, yes, what are they building? If a fox goes off on it, it'll break down their stone wall, right? So what's another tactic that the devil uses, the enemy does, to try to discourage you? It's mockery. It's going to mock you and ridicule you. And so we can expect mockery and ridicule. Christians, we get mocked and ridiculed all the time, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. You're You're behind the times. You don't care about people. You're a bunch of jerks. Right? You ever been mocked for standing for Christ? Ridiculed for the stance? As the culture calls you a bigot, an idiot, a hateful person, right? Ever experienced that before? Quick, quick point. This is kind of, kind of an off, off the cuff here, but uh, Samaria. If you look at Samaria on the map, where that is, that is now part of Palestine. Where the, you know you hear the Palestinians and the Jews that conflict. That's part of Palestine. And then we've got Ammon, uh, which we saw here. That's, uh, who do we have? Tobiah, the Ammonite. That would be Jordan today, the country of Jordan. So if you're looking at a Middle East map, that's that. And the Arabs, the men of Ashdod, that's, they're, they're in what's called the Gaza Strip. All right? So what you've got right now is you've got Israel, and surrounded by Israel are all these people. And this is still happening today. The people that are around that hated the Jews right here, they're the exact same people that are hating him and want to destroy Israel. They want to destroy God's people in Israel. Not a great place to be in Israel because everybody around you for like a thousand miles wants you to be annihilated from the earth. And that's what was happening here. So uh, it goes on, verse four. It says, Hear, O O our God, for we are uh, despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight for they have provoked you in anger to anger in the presence of the builders all right i read that is that that's kind of a weird prayer ain't it a little bit like like if jesus was praying you know like you hear jesus praying in the new testament and he says, you know, pray for your enemies, right? L- l- listen to this prayer. Turn back their taunts on their own heads. Give them up to be plundered in a land, right? Uh, pretty harsh, right? Um, where they are captives. Make them be, ca- be slaves, right? This is the prayer he's praying. This is, do not cover their guilt. Don't, don't let their guilt be out for everybody to see how guilty they are. Let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. Make sure that they get, get what's coming to them. And you're thinking, well, geez, that's kind of a harsh, harsh prayer. Um, it, it don't, I mean, why, why would he pray that kind of a thing? You know, how do you reconcile this with Jesus who told us, hey, bless those who persecute you, right? Pray for your enemies. Uh, love your enemies. Let me give you an example to try to explain why it's okay for him to pray this. Um, I want you to imagine that a guy, a guy comes into a building and he brings a gun and he just, for no reason that we know of, just pops off four or five people. And the cops get here. And when the cops get here, they take him in. 
And they look at this and they say, you know what? It's okay. We're going to show mercy. We're going to be merciful because government is about mercy. And so we're going to show mercy to this person. You know what? Don't you do that again. You can go. Is that right? That's not right. Why? Because the role of government, the role of government is not to be merciful. The role of government is to, uh, is to do justice. Okay? And so one of the problems in America today that we have is that the government's decided to be an institution of mercy rather than an institution of justice. So if you go to Seattle, where I moved from, and I'm sure glad that I'm here, but it's getting a lot more like that now here than it was a few years ago. In Seattle, they just complete the, the city council in Seattle, I'm not lying at all, they made it so that police are not able to arrest people for almost pretty much anything. You can have as much, uh, as much uh, heroin as you want on you, they can't arrest you. It's just ridiculous because they've said, we're not going to obey the law, we're going to be merciful. Right? The right thing for us to do as a, as a government is just to be nice to everybody and just to say everything's okay and everything's good. And that's not justice. What about this family, the families of the people who got shot, right? There's no justice there. What we expect from government is justice. And so right now, what you have in this passage is you have the governor of Judah praying as a governor of Judah. He is praying, he is praying for justice. That's what you have. That's why he's praying this way. Now, as an individual, we pray for justice too. But we also are supposed to pray like God says, pray uh, for mercy, pray for people. But we still want justice to be laid out, right? We still want to experience justice. And so, uh, and so the enemy tried to stop the progress of God's people, first of all, by being, showing a bunch of anger and getting in their face and being angry. And then the next thing they did is they mocked and ridiculed them, right? Mocked and real, ah, you guys can't do it, you know? A fox is going to go up on the thing and the whole thing's going to collapse because you guys don't know how to build in verse 6, it says, so we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. So what we see here is that despite the opposition, they kept going, right? And so because they, 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 they spoke loud, and they yelled at him, and they screamed at him, you're a bigot, you're this, because they did that, and they ridiculed them, they still continued on, and so now the enemy's gone up the ante, Right? Because he's not going to stop there. Now, now it becomes more than words. Now it's going to be more. So this is what you can expect from the enemy. Look at what it says. It says, but when uh, Sambalot and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. Still angry. Man, just think of the enemies of the church and think of the people that hate the church right now. They're very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. So, so, so they see this coming and they, they prepare for it. How do they prepare for this? The first thing they do is they turn this over to God. They pray and say, God, God we're, we're going to do some things. We're going to put people at the, at the gates. We're going we're gonna to get some swords. We're going to have people ready to defend us, right? We're going we're to be physically prepared for that. But at the same time, we're going to pray, God. We're going to ask you, God, to, on our behalf, fight our battle for us. God fight our battle, but it starts with prayer here. And so number three, so we can expect anger, we can expect ridicule and mockery, and then finally we can expect physical attacks against us. You say, well, now you're getting a little ridiculous. You can, as a Christian, you can expect physical attacks? Yeah, you can expect physical attacks. Nehemiah is under authority and protection of Artaxerxes here, though, did Remember when he, he went to the king? He said, hey, can you give me safe passage, right? He's got a letter there that says that he's protected, right? So, so Sambalah, he can't just come in as the governor of Samaria and just come in there with guns a-blazing and come in there with swords and start hacking people up. He can't do that. He can't just kill everybody. So he's got to go on the down low, right? So he does it the way, he does it like a jihadist. You do it like a jihadist, 
right? So they find individuals that are out kind of by themselves. They sneak in, they kill a few people, they get out, right? A few people get killed here, a few get killed there, right? And they say, well, hey, you guys, you guys were violent against us. And Artaxerxes says, hey, is that true? Hey, so Sambalah's like, I, I don't know nothing about it. You know, I didn't see anything. I, I don't know. I, don't, I can't control these people. Your people are there. I, I have no control over that. I can't tell people what to do and what they can't do. We see that today in, in the Muslim countries, right? They'll, they'll, say, they'll say, well, we can't control. They don't represent us, right? That jihadist doesn't represent me. Right, because there's no control there. Right? And that's kind of what's able to happen here. He's able to say, well, I don't control them. And I'm not making any kind of a claim about Islam with that. That's not my, my point here. What I'm saying is that that's the way this is here. That Sambalah is able to say, well, I excuse this. Right? I, I, I'm not, I'm not, you can't hold me accountable for this because they're working on their own. Right? And they don't represent, represent me, though he really does though they really do. Verse 10, it says, in Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By yourselves, you will not be able to rebuild the wall. And the enemy said, they will not know or, or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. So here's, here's, here's what happened here. Now you're getting verbal threats, right? So we can expect verbal threats, okay? Satan sometimes will use verbal threats against you. You start getting a threat and you're like, oh boy, well, I don't want to, I'm not going to stand up now for what's right because I'm being threatened. This is going to happen. This will be the result if I do what, what I've been doing. And it goes on verse 12. And it says at that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us 10 times, you must return to us. What just happened there? What happened there? So you've got uh, people that aren't working on the wall, but they're Jews, right? They're in the area. And they're, they're Jews, right? They're, they're Jewish people, but they're not a part of the, part of the solution. They're people that, are, that claim themselves as Jews, but they're on the sidelines and they're talking to each other and saying, oh, that's never going to work. That's never going to work. And so now they come in and over and over, it says 10 times they come and say, oh, you got to join us. You got to stop this and just join us being on the side, right? And so what we find here is that we can expect negativity from those that are, aren't involved in the work. We'll see that in church. We'll see people that are always real negative about stuff that we do as a church or things that we'll see. And they're like, but then I'm like, well, where are you involved? You're not even involved here. You're not even ministering here. You're not even doing anything here. All you're doing, or people in the community, they'll look and they'll have a problem with what's happening at Sunrise Bible Church. It's like, you don't even go here, right? You claim to, you claim to have all kinds of interest in this place, but I haven't seen you here since I've been here. So why are you all concerned? Your negativity is not helping anybody. So Satan may use the negativity of others to, dis to discourage you from standing for Christ. At verse 13, it says, So in the lowest parts of the place behind the wall, in open, open places, stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. So look, these guys got weapons now. These guys got weapons now. They're not just going to say, oh, well, God... You'll protect me. Right? They prayed to God and asked for protection, but they're also packing. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. I want you to notice that right there. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. See, Nehemiah encouraged the people by reminding them of the Lord who is great and awesome. There's a whole lot of reasons why they're discouraged. People are angry at them. People are yelling at them. There's verbal threats. There's physical violence that's happening. People are getting picked off one at a time. And the encouragement that he gives is not, hey, but you've got a sword. The encouragement he says is that the God that we're serving and this is for, he's great and he's awesome. And that's my word to you today is that, is that the God that we serve that has told us how we should live and, and that is behind the, the lifestyle that we live and the things that we say and the things, I want you to know that, that God is good and he's awesome. And that he wins in the end. He always wins in the end. He does not fail. Remember that song? He does not fail. We read another song that we sang. 
uh, he, he doth to, to bring us woe. Remember that one? In, in doth bring us woe, our foe. So in the lowest parts, it goes on. Satan discourages God's people basically by turning their attention to the opposition rather than to God. So how is Satan going to discourage you? He's going to get you to not be looking at God, but to get you looking at all the people in school that's all mad at you and why they want to kick you off the school board and why they want to they silence you and why you got put in Facebook jail and why you have all... They're trying to do all this and you're getting all discouraged and, and, what, and the encouragement that he gives is, hey, listen... God is good and he's great and he's awesome. And you're standing with him. It's always good to be wherever God is. Right? Goes on. Here we go. When the enemies heard that it was known to us that the God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of the servants worked construction and half held spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. These guys that are holding swords are just as active in the ministry as the people that are building the wall. They're just as important. He split it down the middle and said, we're going to have half of you is going to be just keeping watch and making sure that they're not picking people off and we're going to protect ourselves and we've got God on our side and he's great and awesome, but we're also going to keep building the wall. We're not going to stop. We're just going to protect ourselves in the process. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. So you've got a trowel on one. You're gonna, you put a rock down and a trowel and you've got the other hand's got a sword just in case somebody goes out. That's how we function as a church. Ready for what's going to happen. That's what it's talking about. And it goes on. It says, and each of the builders had a sword strapped on his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles, to the officials, and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. Okay, so this is scary. This is the problem. It's a big area. It's a lot of area here, and there's a lot of wall going all over the place, a wall over here and wall over there, and there's gaps in the wall, and there's a lot of this, and so my, my friend that's going to protect me might not be right here, right? We might not be right by each other. He might be a ways away, and so you got a trumpet, and here's what you're going to do when you hear that trumpet. It says, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So how do we do this as a result? In order to win this battle, you need the person right next to you. If you're going to be victorious, living for Christ, living for Jesus, serving him faithfully in a world that is corrupt and that is trying to, try to go a completely different, different way, in a world that hates you, if you're going to be successful and live with that, you need the people that are in this room. You need the people that are believers that are here. And we will blow that trumpet every Sunday and I need you to come and be ready, right? To pray for each other, to encourage each other, to lift each other up, to, to, to be the man and women of God that God has called us to be. We're gonna have to stick together. And, and right here, it's bad. They're scared, they're nervous. It says, yeah, but we're together. And there's a rallying cry. I'm gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna blow that horn. And when you hear that horn or when you hear that bell of the church ring, come running and be ready be ready to be equipped to follow God. And Nehemiah makes his people set up an earthly defense against Israel. So the devil is a roaring lion. Did you know that? Seeking those he may devour. And so you need to defend yourself, right? It says in, in Ephesians chapter 6, it says that we put on the whole armor of God, right? Why, why does he say that? Be, because our, it says that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers enthroned where? Heavenly places, right? And so we've got to be careful about that. And we must be ready to minister and do battle at the same time. And, and, and I'll, I'll say this. There's one more thing I'll, I'll put in. Nehemiah has them rally together for God to fight rallying together we need as a church to rally together in this fight all right 
Share the gospel, but defend against the schemes of the devil at the same time. Let's finish it up. It says in verse 21, so we labored at the work and half of them held the spear in the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem and they may be a guard for us by night and may labor and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brother or nor my servants nor the men or the guard who follow me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his side. You, you ever sleep in your clothes? How many of you are making a habit of sleeping in your clothes? You like to sleep in your clothes. You're like, you know what? I'm just going to leave my boots on today. And I'm just going to sleep in my boots today. I'm going to leave my jacket on. Nobody sleeps. Like, you know why you don't do that? Because it's completely uncomfortable. It's totally not comfortable to sleep in your clothes. But the thing is, if you're going, sometimes serving God and following God and doing what God wants as a part of the, it's going to require you to, to face some discomfort. It's going to require, you're going to face some discomfort. If you're going to follow Christ in this world now, the way the world is, and over the next year, two years, three years, it's going to get uncomfortable, right? It's going to be worse than sleeping with your boots on, right? But they're like, you know, we're willing to do that, to defend ourselves. We're willing to sleep with our clothes on. We're willing to, because well, we're going to be ready. We're going to do what we've got to do. It might mean that there are things that, that, that I've, they've become kind of my security blanket. There are things that I just do to relax and, and enjoy, but I got to get rid of those, right? Maybe, maybe I, just, I, I just watch TV all night, right? Because it's, it's just my enjoyable thing and, and I know there's stuff that's feeding me that's not good that I'm watching all the time, but I don't care, right? And maybe, 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 well, maybe that needs to stop, right? Will you sacrifice comfort? Will you sacrifice an activity that brings temptation, right? Even though you're comfortable with these people. Yeah, I'm comfortable with them. They know me. Yeah, but... They believe what the whole, whole world believes, and they're in affecting you, right? We are going to face opposition, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse, and it's happening rapidly. Um, and we're going to need each other as a church to walk through this together, okay? We're going to need each other. We need to be ready for those things that the devil is going to bring our way, Okay? The enemy, he's got a lot of people on his side. We have to be ready, ready to stand. And we're in this together, okay? Let's come up, let's sing one last song. Let's pray. God, we are a people that want to serve you faithfully. We don't want to be deceived by the enemy. We don't want to be deceived by the world. We want to think for ourselves. And we want to follow what your word says. And your word is really clear to us on these issues. And yet it's been so distorted, so... <sighs> it's disheartening, God. But, but we are encouraged by knowing this, that we serve a great and awesome God. And I don't serve a great and awesome God myself, but... I serve a great and awesome God beside a whole bunch of other people in this room who serve a great and awesome God who want what's best for me and I want what's best for them, who wants to see victory in each individual life in this room, who wants to defend each other, each individual person in this room. God, we pray for each other. God, we pray for our church. We pray for your mission and your vision. We surrender it to you, our great and awesome God, Jesus. Oh, your hands of kindness are here for me. And I've heard they are silken and can carry me. 